Hi, this is Robert Cahoon for Catholic Pulse and really blessed to have a jo Dame Joanna Bogle who's joining us for our first interview here with Catholic Pulse. Uh, Joanna is a journalist in background. Uh, she has the award of a Dame of the Order of St. Gregory the Great um, and she's also a renowned author of over 20 books, is featured prominently on EWTN and has got involved in a whole range of Catholic projects around the United Kingdom, which we're going to hear about in just a moment, from St. Mary's University to Catholic History Walks to Bible projects for schools. And uh, she's been a great advocate of Catholic heritage in the United Kingdom. So it's, it's really fascinating to speak with Joanna. She's a good friend of mine and certainly a, a veteran of the English Catholic scene here in the United Kingdom. So, uh, Joanna, how are you today? I'm rushed since you ask and I probably look it I, you know I've been rushing that was running from the station so I'm rushed <laughs> <laughs> and um tell us a bit about you know, some of the books you've, you've you're an author of over over 20 books and uh, which ones are your favorites um uh, we'll, we'll come on to sort of Catholic heritage and promoting it in, in just a moment but out of all the books you've written which one we've had um one on Caroline Chisholm there's English Catholic Heroines, a yearbook of seasons and celebrations. Which is the favourite book which you've uh, written? Is it even uh, Welcome to the Church, It's Awful, I think, as well? <laughs> one of the, that one as well. So which one is your favourite and uh, what do you most enjoy writing about? Well, I think it's the most ghastly thing for an author to say. My favourite book, <laughs> me, I, I, me, ghastly. I don't know. If you ask me for my favourite book, it wouldn't be one I'd written. I suppose, I don't know, the book of my heart was Caroline Chisholm. She was on the back of the $5 note in Australia. Find out about her. It's her story, not mine. And she was a heroine of the Australian Outback. A wonderful story, a model for Catholic women, Christian women in service to the poor and the, the needy. And I dedicated that book to my beloved Australian parents-in-law who were so nice to me. I think I must be a ghastly daughter-in-law, very disappointing given the other pretty and charming possibilities, my other sisters-in-law and most gorgeous girls. And, and yet my in-laws were just gorgeous to me right from the start. I was the first girl in the family marrying their eldest son and, and that, they've both gone to their reward now, but I dedicated the book to them. And, uh, and how did you get involved in journalism in the first place? So you started out writing for the local newspaper. Where, where did your career start? Oh, I can thank Miss Briley of, at school. Nobody forgets a good teacher. I remember there was a slogan about that. And dear, dear Miss Briley, who's gone to her reward, was the English teacher. We had to write an essay of what I will do, you know, when I leave school. And I was a, a rather show off, unpleasant uh, girl, I think. And oh, I was going to be a famous writer. I was going to write books, on and so forth. And when I got my essay back, it had those red words at the bottom do you remember see me which usually meant work not up to standard but I got a good mark so I went to see Miss Briley and she said well the reason that we asked you all to write these essays is we're trying to match you with a, somebody who can give you some advice on, on your career of course you know it'd be lovely to be a writer how are you going to do it oh Miss Briley I said I I'm going to write you know our famous things I think somewhere in the background was a beloved husband with a, a silver tea tray coming in and some well scrubbed children and so on. But I was just going to be a famous writer. And she said, what will you do between leaving school and your first successful book being published? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, you know, how would I eat? And she said, had I thought of journalism? Well, in a sort of way I had, but neither of us knew how to go about it. And because she was such a nice woman, she, she found out. And actually, in those happy days, uh, you could apply to a local newspaper for a job. And I lived in Greater London and allowing for changing trains at Clapham Junction, I could reach about 40 different local papers, all gone now. So I got a job on one of them, Surrey Comet, and they had a, 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 a Richmond edition called the Richmond Herald. And I was given a job on the Richmond Herald, moved to the Surrey Comet. Very hard work, running around with a notebook, lots of shouting at you to get things done. I loved it. I worked extremely hard, long hours, great fun, and it was excellent training and tough discipline. Uh, I loved it, and that's how it began. That's how it began. And journalism is quite a different world now. It's it's really come. You know, the internet's had a, such a huge influence on on journalism. Uh, what's your perspective on the the contemporary state of journalism? Well, you can't you can't stop the internet. It, it exists. There's something terribly sad about our inability to read and indeed to write. I 
meet bright, friendly young people whose knowledge of English grammar is minimal. Uh, they don't even know about paragraphs or even sentences. Um, and some of them don't know about capital letters after a full stop and so on. So we talk instead of writing. I mean, I'm doing it now. Um, local newspapers, of course, have vanished. And with them, that passionate, vibrant local life, a local paper could campaign that the motorway should not destroy this village or whatever. Gone, all gone. Everything is now international. I find it sad. So my perspective is a sad one, but writing still exists. and There is scope for new possibilities. But we should keep our standards of communication up and in particular we must we must teach children good english and grammar so that they have the tools for the job otherwise it's like thinking google translate means you don't need to speak french or german or whatever so i'm gloomy but there are possibilities and uh, tell us about the catholic history walks you've be, uh, been doing in london and some of the, the great sites that that there are and how we can promote uh, Catholic heritage in the United Kingdom. We've got this great Catholic history and, you know, part of this Catholic policy is to help promote the beautiful things that we have, the interesting, exciting things that are happening in the church. How are the history walks going? And where are some of the places that you're going to? Well, London is one of the world's greatest cities. I'm a Londoner and, and proud of it. But all of our country is rich in history. We're not a new country, we're a very old one. And there's good and bad in our history. All our history is really Christian history. Our, our story begins with the Roman Empire, that same Roman Empire into which Christ our Saviour was born. And we know that Christianity came at a very early date. There were Christians in Britannia long before the Angles and Saxons invaded from the pagan lands outside the empire and turned it into England. So there's everything here. In London, we've got buckets and buckets of history. A, a big mistake that some Catholics make is to start uh, with Reformation history, and, and that's the wrong place to start. Start at the beginning. Um, start with the arrival of the faith in our land. It's not difficult to find out. There's lots and lots of excellent material written there. And start also where you're standing, which in London means pretty well every hinge has got a story. When I was a little girl, we lived in a place called Wallington, which tells you it was an ancient British settlement, anything with wall or wall in it, like the country Wales. It comes from the Saxon word for a stranger of the ancient British. Our church was St Elphidge, Saxon name, martyred by the Vikings. Start where you are. I learned about St Elphidge. I learned about Christianity. And then, of course, there's the whole of London's history. And be open and large minded. Before we hop on about the way Catholics suffered at the Reformation, remember that there were Protestants burnt alive at the stake. Take the large view. We can afford to be generous. We are Christians and we can be forgiving and generous. And with two papal visits enormously successful, the future of the church in our country is bright and we should rest on a sense of being able to be large and generous. And look at some of the great non-Catholic Christians, like, you know, the story of the Salvation Army and so on in modern times. So go back to the beginning, be large and be very proud of our glorious Catholic faith. And some of the some of the routes that you do on the uh, Catholic history walks, where, where do you go from and to St Thomas More's house and um, Tower Bridge, this kind of thing? Which, yes, which, uh, there's, yeah. there's lots of places to start. Chelsea, as you've indicated, is a good place to start. The mm -hmm. Church of St Thomas More in Chelsea, walk down to the river and walk to the site of his manor house and then round to where the seminary now stands, um, Allen Hall, named after the great Cardinal William Allen on the site of his garden. Lots of places will be marked. Um, some of them people don't even know the names of his daughters after they married and so on. Lots of street names there. Richmond, lots and lots there. Walk along the river uh, to get to Ham where Cardinal John Henry Newman spent his summer childhood holidays. Start in the city of London. My goodness me, there's just so much history there. Follow the ancient Roman wall. Start at the Tower of London, big fragment of the wall, start with the Romans there. Of course, you've got the tower, John Fitzgerald, Thomas More, heroes like Edmund Campion, although there's no hero quite as noble as Edmund Campion. Uh, of course, all of, all of that. The river is a good walk and it's fun, beautiful to walk along it. So find some river walks, cross the bridge at Richmond and walk to Strawberry Hill at Wickenham, 
lots of stuff there. And the college at Strawberry Hill, the history of which I've written. Those are just some. And finish at the pub. Mm -hmm. And the website's catholichistorywalks.com for anyone who's interested. And you're also doing some uh, work at St Mary's University. Tell us about the uh, project that you're, you're doing at St Mary's. Yes, uh, great fun. Um, the story of St Mary's is immensely interesting. I did my postgraduate theology degree there and I realised there was a rich story. It's not that old, it, it's back to the 1850s and it was founded as a college to train men as Catholic teachers. We need to remember that in the 19th century when modern forms of education began, the Catholic Church was at the forefront we didn't get any state schools until 1870. And by then there'd been two or three generations of people educated by the Catholic Church, especially the poor, oh, especially the poor, but mostly girls. Girls were favored in education. A lot of poor families in the 18th and 19th centuries thought why educate a boy he doesn't need reading and writing, book learning. He should be out and about by the age of seven, eight working. Little girls were allowed to read and write, but a lot of working class families, oh no, no, oh, it's a waste of time. So the church had to try to help parents see that a boy could learn to read and write and should. And they, they already had colleges for lady teachers and they started one for men. It's a heroic story. And then add to that over 150 years of splendid, splendid work and still going on. And long columns of names on the college war memorials. Strawberry Hill, St Mary's College has served our country well. It's now a university and was visited by beloved Pope Benedict uh, on his visit in 2010. It needs to carve out a new journey for itself in this century and I think can do so, but it must rest on the wonderful achievement of the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, certainly it's a great university today and it's great that you're involved with with the history of the building there and uh, and a project tell us about some of your other projects and endeavors like the bible project for schools uh, association of catholic women um so the advent event at westminster cathedral and uh, ewtn etc well I, I would like to talk about the school's bible project um mm -hmm. It grew out of an ecumenical venture, uh, Christians of different denominations getting together. And there were things we wanted to stand firm on, like marriage, the lifelong union of a man and a woman and so on. But we really needed to, to do something simple that would bring us all together in, and really nourish the roots of our faith. And we realised Christianity does have a place as of right in our schools. It, it is meant to be taught as one of the world's great religions. And there's meant to be an emphasis on it, because you don't understand why we number our years the way we do or have the public holidays that we do unless you understand Christianity. So we launched the school's Bible project. It's very simple. You encounter Christ. Every year we produce a really attractive snazzy brochure. Well perhaps snazzy is the wrong word. It's it's a serious but attractive brochure. It invites pupils to find out about six incidents in the life of Christ, and we choose dramatic ones. He calms the storm at the sea, he rises from the dead, and so on. Imagine they were present and write about it. And we found that teachers really like it. It works well with pupils of all abilities. That's, that's very useful. We have very attractive prizes, including a, a cash prize for the winning schools, book prizes for the pupils. And when we're allowed to, not in the middle of a coronavirus, but um, but we, the top winners, uh, there are lots of runner-up winners, but the top winners come to London and get their prizes from one of our trustees, Baroness Cock at the House of Lords. And teenagers being what they are, they stand on one leg and, and fiddle with their hair and stuff, but they do enjoy it. And we've had, oh, just gorgeous families that come, all races, religious backgrounds. I, I've always remembered one just gorgeous family where the mum, who wasn't very old herself, stood there and, and cried as her daughter got her prize. And I remember thinking, no, or, or I'm going to cry too. We just had these lovely moments. I think, I, I think the whole thing's been worthwhile. And it's marked its 30th anniversary, and we're, we're going ahead with, with, with more. From that have grown some other projects. Um, and I like doing this work in schools, and I honour our teachers, some of whom have a very tough job. Um, our, our country has got a lot of problems associated with family breakup and a lot of boys and girls in school are going through a tough time including some from very comfortable rich families and all that um, 
and a good stable school that can also develop a child spiritually and give them something of our heritage. I mean, what a, what a beautiful thing. So being a tiny part of that is worthwhile. Uh, and what gives you hope and inspiration about uh, the Catholic faith for uh, the future in this country? Have you got a, a bleak look at the future or doing this school's work uh, gives you hope and, and aspiration? I do have a, a sense of hope, oh yes, about the future of the Catholic Church in our country. We have a noble heritage and it's a, a wide one. It includes all sorts of uh, things from recusant families uh, who held onto the faith against all the odds in difficult years, uh, right the way through to the way, because of the way history has developed in our country, people are very open to Catholicism now and we've been blessed with some very remarkable popes. One of the most extraordinary things was the sight of Pope John Paul from Poland, a country which has now sent us huge numbers of young people in recent years, which we didn't know was going to happen in 1982. Mm -hmm. He came at that time uh, speaking uh, as the successor of Peter, but coming from a country which had had a terrible time under Nazism and was still suffering under communism and had tea with the Queen. There was an old healing of, oh, a beautiful healing of old problems. While he spoke, oh, with such coverage about the future. And this was then followed up in 2010 by Pope Benedict who beatified, and, and now he's been canonized by Pope Francis, our beloved John Henry Newman. All of this is very ordinary, very rounded in the life of ordinary people in the country. And this is wonderful because there was a narrative that said Catholicism is really strange and weird, and there's nothing strange or weird about, uh, you know, John Paul having tea with the Queen. It was sort of homey. So I, that's our story in the background. And going forward, these are the things that are now part of our history. So that's all good. I've also seen Youth 2000. I've been at uh, New Dawn at Walsingham with loud music, too loud in my view for what it's worth. Um, I've been on all night vigils. I've been to Night Fever, where there's a deep love of the Blessed uh, Sacrament and a much easier evangelization. We're no longer dealing with the bickering of the post Reformation era. We're talking to a wounded nation. We're a wounded church, our history, but also, we, you know, everybody knows current problems. Oh, I think we've got everything to fight for. And we don't have to struggle, as Poland does, as Ireland does, with a very, very powerful church, which historically has, has, has had almost perhaps too much power. And we haven't got to struggle, as Spain has, with imposing Catholicism, you know, through laws. No, we can speak through freedom. That's a gift. We're a very, how can I put it, a very Vatican II church in Britain. That's a gift. That's uh, we, a gift. We've just got this incredible Catholic history in, you know, the UK. And it's not just the Reformation. I mean, the recusant homes are incredible, but then it's, you know, Thomas More, it's uh, St. Thomas Beckett, it's... Uh, St. Aidan and the Northern Saints, you know, we are drowning in this incredible history and culture, much of which isn't taught particularly well in schools, is not known by even the average sort of lay person. Um, but, you know, what I really love is, is bringing this heritage to life. And that's what you're doing through the history walks, but also through the project with schools. And, you know, the more that we can bring this great history to life. Tell us about some of the work with uh, EWTN and that's that's been a bit back, you've done one with a uh, series on cooking haven't you or uh, yes. feasts, feasts and seasons but what, what other work have you done with EWTN? We have to understand that more yeah. than anything else one of the things we can offer in Britain is this rich heritage and it's a living heritage. Our place names, our pub signs, our nursery rhymes, the foods we eat at different times of the year, these are all rooted in our Catholic heritage so we just need to unpack it. Daffodils, they're named after St. David. It's his feast day on the 1st of March. Hmm? Why do we eat eggs at Easter? It's new life. The hens are laying again and our Christian ancestors didn't eat eggs during Lent. They gave that up along with other rich foods. Even now there's a tradition, what are you giving up for Lent? It's kind of in the language. We need to understand how our calendar works. Even our tax year runs from April to April each year. That's really essentially March to March. And it's all about the dating of the Incarnation, the Annunciation, Lady Day, March the 25th. Why do we have pub signs that have the seven stars, that stars around Mary's head? There's so much. So if you study the history, and 
I know there are ways you can do that, that you can do it through Catholic work and Catholic television and booklets. Make it fun. This is a source for evangelizing. Now, I think it's a great mistake to think the evangelizing is always arguing. We do need to teach the faith. We need to teach it. And we have in the catechism of the Catholic Church too much neglected by our Catholic people. A really, really good handbook. Look up anything you like in the index. You know, you can explain. But let's start with arguing. Start by explaining to people that this is a faith into which they are living and they're born, regardless of their own family story. If they're living in Britain, this is something they live and breathe. I think it's a pity as well to assume that you have to sort of impose a decision on people when you're going to accept Christ. As we know, and it's very much part of our Catholic tradition and culture, we have to make a new decision for Christ every day, after every repentance for sin, uh, every confession. So we, we shouldn't sort of, you know, are you going to be a Christian? Bang, now you are one. It, it's not like that. And that's also part of our heritage, as is having to say sorry for our own mistakes and those of others. And I think a very beautiful part of our tradition in Britain is that even at a time when Catholics were misunderstood and there were laws against the Catholic faith following the events of the Reformation, Catholics loved their country. I, I suppose for me, a most poignant thing is St Edmund Campion prayed for his monarch, who was Elizabeth I, who was incredibly cruel to Catholics, prayed for her on the scaffold. He was asked, do you pray for the monarch? And he said, yes, I, I, I wish her a godly reign with all prosperity. This is the generous spirit of love. Well, you can push this too far. Catholics are not all saints like Campion. But we've got a wonderful heritage and we should share it. And I think we should always offer an attractive way in you know don't start with are you a sinner because the answer is yeah aren't we all start with a heritage that is there for all to share and that can be proposed not imposed i think i think we've got everything to play for and we're a hungry nation you know we're very broken and unhappy there's a lot of unhappiness due to family breakup and there's a muddle about our history who are we tell the catholic story and it begins to come together very sweetly very gently very nobly what, what are some of the, the best ways uh, you've kind of come across in recent years to, to share the faith and evangelize and to share this great heritage that we have? You know, um, you've mentioned the I... brokenness of society and everything. And, you know, how do we engage? Uh, how do we share Christ with others? And how do we evangelize in a positive way in, you know, in contemporary Britain? I think I'd start by saying my most my biggest memories are the ones where I've got it wrong, you know. One of the things I've learned, I think we all learn, golly, is that when people ask one question, they often really mean another. So somebody who says aggressively, why does the church oppress gays? Don't, don't plunge right in at his level of anger. But sometimes, well, in one particular instance of that, I, I realised that it was partly a bloke saying, I've messed up my life. And uh, he wasn't uh, involved with homosexual attraction at all. That wasn't his problem. But there have been other issues about sexual morality. Now, I'm not going to say that to him. But if you start with the thought, why, why is he asking this question? And is there another way in? And sometimes in, a, in an expression that I found very helpful from David Alton, a, a wonderful active Catholic, when we were discussing something quite separate, he once said uh, of a different topic, but he said, let's approach this problem sideways. I think I've learned sometimes you approach things sideways. You get alongside somebody and not opposite them. So sometimes tradition and heritage and place names and so on are important. Sometimes ministering, to, to use a slightly pompous expression, for somebody's for somebody's need for friendship, for example, or, or, or kindness or goodwill uh, is the best way in to start with. And then being alongside, not, uh, not confrontational. And then sometimes you do have to allow people to understand, and, and you can do this in a humorous way, that they've got completely the wrong end of the stick. And a lot of people just really have no idea about Catholicism. And they will accuse a Catholic of a problem that is, for example, a Puritan problem. You know, you know, the funniest one, which was really too ridiculous for words, was, you know, why are Catholics supposed to drink? I mean, if only, you know, if it's uh, <laughs> or anything the other way around. And, um, and I remember this idea, you know, it, it, Christians don't enjoy themselves. Well, Catholicism, if anything, emphasizes almost too much the enjoyment sometimes and not, not always enough. We're good on feasting, not, you know, not so good on fasting. So there's that. And then there is also 
need to share the her heritage. I can't bear Catholics are rather smug about it. I'm a Roman Catholic. And for me, well, that excludes, you know, your neighbor who may well be a lapsed Catholic actually. So assume anyone can and should be a Catholic. Don't necessarily start with where people want you to start, start where they really are, which may not be where they want to be, but sometimes we have to walk into somebody's discomfort zone in order to have a real conversation or else it's all just silly uh, and uh, you know be humorous self-mocking um i think a lot of catholics don't realize how terribly smug they look and i remember once somebody saying well in my time of prayer before the blessed sacrament you know you always say well, you shut up you know just tell us how holy you are i find i can only do this i have to go to this sort of mass or something i'll oh, shut up you know um Assume that most people have an enormous capacity to love God that is perhaps at least as great as our own. Um, I find that Catholic jokes can be quite funny. Um, and non-Catholics can enjoy them, especially sort of confessional jokes, you know, um, because there is something slightly ludicrous, the, the possibility for being misunderstood and, and so on. And also there is a certain healthy curiosity about certain aspects of Catholicism, in, including incidentally about confession sometimes when people ask about it there can be a subtext which says i, I would love to do that i would love to cleanse my soul uh, and there's an understanding when members of one another we're not meant to do this just me and god you've done that you've cried to the dark but why not also hear a human voice also a sinner like you but who's got a a, a, a mandate from god via the apostles that in itself is awesome our lady is also a way in our lady is a way in a lot of people I found and not only girls actually although the one I'm thinking of is a woman but when she was very ill and it was difficult to talk about her illness which was at least potentially terminal I found she loved the idea of Lourdes and so on and you know she didn't even know she didn't know that Our Lady of Lourdes was the Blessed Virgin Mary I mean she just found the idea of a lady interceding to God was lovely and when I explained it and you know quoted Gospel of Luke and explained oh is it Mary you know of Nazareth don't assume people know there's a generation that haven't been taught unless they've been fortunate enough to have the school's bible project mary's a way in and i found that sometimes the hail mary which is very very rich in scripture very gentle sort of prayer actually and pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death um so that's not the scriptural part the first scriptural part from luke is is, is a scriptural part but pray for our sinners i don't know there's something sort of rich about that and Catholics are familiar with this and who hasn't as a Catholic, you know, pray the Hail Mary at the dentist and, and stuff. But this isn't our story. It's just something everyone should share. So don't make it a me thing. And also, I don't think one should let oneself get between the other person and God. So there's this new thing. So I heard somebody on a bus the other day saying, I think I need more me time. I think it's ghastly. That's yeah. California speak. Yeah. Uh, no, we need more God time and other time and serve your neighbor time. I don't think we need more me time. And you can do it even as a Catholic. You can let my story come between you and the person you are evangelizing. So step back, step to the side, let God speak and let yeah. the heritage speak. And this is something we can all share. I don't know. These are, these are my experiences, me, my experiences. No, I think they're experiences of most of us. And as you get older, you get humbler. Yeah. You look in the mirror and you realise you're not pretty and young anymore. So, you know, shut up and let God speak, if that and makes sense. Tell us about some of the funniest moments you remember as part of uh, religious life in, in Britain. <laughs> so, so, you know, we've got father, father 10, what have you. But, you know, sometimes we take ourselves a bit less seriously. Than, yeah, uh, well... Certainly for me, some of the some of the things children have said and, and written, we, we do a project, this is another ecumenical thing, we do a project teaching children the Lord's Prayer, they, they write it out, and uh, they, they, they're also answer some simple questions, understand what it means. And one of the questions is, who taught us this prayer? And one child, what, meaning our Lord taught us this prayer, one child wrote, well, my mum and dad taught me, but I don't know about anybody else. And one child wrote, was it Moses? Good try, but no. <laughs> so you get some lovely stuff in that. I, I suppose, uh, and then very funny stuff in some of the um, Bible project. Uh, you know, there's no room at the inn. Come off it, said Joseph, you know, and this sort of stuff. <laughs> For me personally, I, I suppose one of the funniest experiences was, was just recently, um, it was during lockdown, and 
discovered uh, that you could go to confession at Westminster Cathedral, but they weren't using the confessional, which I would have thought was a bit daft, really, because I would have thought the screen so exactly. would lock off any germs and whatnot, yeah. you know, but there you go. Uh, anyway, so you had to go into a side chapel uh, and it was dark and I could see a figure there with a cloak and he, I thought, well, OK, let's do this. And as he stood up and as I stood, I realised the priest I knew well and I meant to say, Father, give me your blessing for I've sinned. You know, they're using the formula. But what came up was, oh, God, I hate going to confession face to face. And it was so funny because I didn't mean to say that. And I would normally never say, oh, God, I would regard that very offensive. But it was just so real. And <laughs> I remember thinking, that's not what you're meant to say. <laughs> Bless him. He actually did that thing that priests do where you, they sort of cover their face to sort of show, you know, I'm not interested in the person that's gone. And he said, may the Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may confess your sins with true sorrow using a sort of formula. I thought that was beautiful. And it, uh, it made sense of an otherwise utterly ludicrous moment. You get these daft moments. You've survived lockdown as an extrovert. What's uh, what's the experience been like for you? It's been a challenging year, uh, house arrest for, for nearly a year now, on and off. Uh, what's the experience been like for you? I'll be honest, I've loathed the lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very happily married and so on, but it's been very, very difficult. We live in a small flat. My husband has been working from home, or to put it in normal English, our home has been lost because it's now his office. Not pleasant, you know, shouting on the phone and so on. I, you know, it happens. It's, that's what office life is like. I wanted a home. and It's difficult. Uh, what saved me was I was able to be part of a team helping serve breakfast to the homeless at St Patrick's Soho and when I discovered about that uh, I know it's London I was able to get there uh, that saved me uh, so I've been able to do that not every day but that's all part of it and then at Farm Street with lunches as a rotor so that's been a help but I'm not going to boast and say oh you know it's been a deeply beautiful spiritual time it really hasn't I found it annoying and I felt it was time wasted and difficult I, I got on with work I'm a writer I mean writing is work it's a discipline and my my latest book uh well, what a pompous way of putting it but the book I'm working on <laughs> is a biography of Sue Ryder the magnificent uh, Baroness Ryder as she ended up and um, I was able to work on that so the time wasn't wasted but there's so much I could have done and I postponed it. I couldn't do it, like going to her birthplace and where she lived and meet, meeting the people she helped. So it's been a frustrating time. I, I will do this work, but difficult, frustrating, time wasting. Um, I haven't found it easy, but a sense of humour helps. And uh, Jamie and I have been married for 40 years and, you know, you slog it out that long, we'll stick at it. We keep laughing, you know. We, we had our 40th wedding anniversary and uh, my my dear brother and his wife, also in lockdown and she's not been well, arranged to send us a cream tea by post, which you could do, <laughs> we, you know, that kind of fun. And we took a picture of ourselves, you know, as, and we had our cream tea, which was delicious, I may say. So you can do anything if you find it funny. And also I've learned, which you have to learn as a little girl and you're told about, you learn again as a teenager, be grateful. You are not living in the Gulag archipelago as, a, as somebody who read the wrong poem under Stalin and got 25 years. You're not in Auschwitz. You haven't got toothache. You're not in a slum in some awful place where you don't know where the next meal's coming from. So put up and shut up and stop winking. So. <laughs> and uh, Joanna, you got made a dame several years ago of the, uh, the Order of St. Gregory of Great. What, what was that like? And was there a ceremony? And uh, tell us all about that. Well, I, I feel I feel awful about that because the reason that this this honour was given was not to me. I helped to get the big international charity Aid to the Church in Need going in Britain. It it, it was based in Germany. It, its origins were in heroic work in, in the ruins of defeated Germany, and then it spread to so many other parts of the world. And when I got involved, we were we were in Britain, it wasn't so well known at all, and we got the whole thing going a bit in Britain, and we were, were helping people in Eastern Europe. And this was quite exciting work. I would say cloak and dagger, well, cloak, but not actually dagger. When after a great many years, I had to retire as trustee and everything, uh, there was this, this lovely honor, but you know, the people that are the real heroes were the ones who we'll never know about, who died in the squalor and filth of the gulag, 
because they were Christians and so on. So any help that you can give through a charity, uh, you know, but it, it wasn't on a given for that. And and I'm, I'm terribly conscious of what it means. And, and in fact, if I talk by, I'll go all gloppy and, and it just makes me choke. Um, but the, the people who are real heroes in the church are, are the ones who are oppressed in some ghastly prison where they're being treated badly for the faith or something, not those of us who grew up in modest comfort in the free West. So, but it is an honor. And I, what can I say? It just means so much that to be part of the church and to be, be, be able to serve and to meet some super people who've been given the honor for a far nobler work than mine. I mean, you know, it's a big thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and what projects are you working on at the moment and what's coming up in the, in the future? Well, one of the, one of the few good things about lockdown is the ending of it. <laughs> yeah, and um, so some fun things. The Association of Catholic Women is is not a large Catholic women's group, but we dovetail with others, and um, we are running a, a project for schools, uh, helping children to understand the importance of Sunday. Uh, John Paul's Pierre's Domini, and we're working on that and getting children in primary schools, Catholic primary schools, to understand that, and um, prizes for the best work, little essays they write and stuff. So that's fun. Uh, during lockdown, I, I uh, sat there, I, not typing, handwriting lots of envelopes to schools. So if you're watching this, you've got a handwritten envelope um, with our very attractive brochure in, so that's happening. Uh, I've got a new biography I'm working on of Sue Ryder, and it'd be a great honour to meet her daughter, uh, who's going to write a foreword, and meet people who worked with her over the years. That would be very exciting. So there's that. And that book will come out for the centenary of Sue Ryder's birth, which is 2023, but it'll come out in 2022. I hope to be involved with some projects for 2022, marking the anniversary of Pope John Paul's saint, John Paul's visit to Britain. Um, I'd like to, there are some things going on there. So it is a feeling of awakening um, after the lockdown and long postponed projects. My history walks will start again as soon as ever we can. And um, I've got to check the tide tables. One of the more absurd things of a history walk was I didn't check the autumn tides. We walked on the potato path at Richmond. Uh, somebody said turn back the tide's coming in and I thought what nonsense tiny trickle <laughs> and the next thing we knew we're up to our ankles then our knees and as we waded with it coming up literally to our thighs and waists and clutching onto the wall um learned the lesson fortunately everyone had a good sense of humor so summer history walk check the tides autumn history walk really check the tides these will be the things I'm doing over the next month Brilliant. And you're a huge fan of John Paul II. I, I became a Catholic in 2004, you know, uh, partly due to the inspiration of, um, you know, St. John Paul II, um, incre incredible man. You're, you're also a huge fan. Um, what, what really attracts you to, to John Paul II? You know, what, what was it about him that you must have been here for the UK visit in 1982, um, would probably vividly remember that. Uh, what, what was it about John Paul II that really brought the Catholic faith alive? John Paul II is one of my great heroes. Yeah. I think he gave us a new modern, if silly way, but expression, but a new way, a modern way of being Catholic. There was nothing apologetic about it. It was open and large. He brought a history that no Pope in modern times has had. He didn't go to a conventional seminary. He had to study in secret under communism. And he had to study in secret under the Nazis. He then had to minister in great difficulties under communism. He was a hero under the Nazis. Uh, it took real courage to keep Polish Catholic culture alive. He was a hero under communism. So there was something large and exciting about him, which simply had not been the case with any other pope in my, in my childhood or youth. Although Paul VI was a very brave and good man, bringing the Second Vatican Council to a successful conclusion and, 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 and giving us humane vitae. But John Paul had this largeness, and he took the names of his two predecessors, real humility. Then he was succeeded by the magnificent Benedict with whom he'd worked as Ratzinger. So there was this real teamwork, and somewhere in that mix is the Pole and the German, the philosopher and the theologian. There were so many exciting stories, and I benefited from the catechism, which was a real work of, of Ratzinger, then with humility, you know, it was published under John Paul and so on. There's just a wonderful teamwork there. There's everything I've loved. And John Paul, 
understood real humility, not false humility, but the real deal and his immense gifts. He also understood the modern problems of the church that we needed to explain the great might and power of the church in medieval times had much that was glorious, but there was also much that we didn't get right, burning people at the stake. He was large enough to say, the methods were wrong, the teaching is right. And that was John Paul and Ratzinger. He was large enough to see <clears throat> that in every era, the church has to be taught, has to teach a new, teach in a new way. You can't just say, as people did in my teenage years, all oh, the old penny catechism's good enough for me. Well, it didn't, for example, explain that contraception was wrong. We had to be taught that because it wasn't something, it was an issue when that catechism was in its heyday. It is now. John Paul understood you, you fight the good fight for today and tomorrow. And the equipment of yesterday isn't the same as the pure glorious doctrine of yesterday, which was unchanging and true. He had enormous courage. He was, he had two attempts on his life. Uh, there was that shooting in, in, in St. Peter's Square and then a priest, a, run, a breakaway priest from a, a breakaway, a group of Lefebvre's group tried to kill him, stabbing him. They found the blood on his undergarment. You know, there's so much courage there. So he's my, he's my model. My patron saint is Joan of Arc and in a way I couldn't wish for a better one. But, I like the fact that I can claim John Paul because it's the same name, John, Jane, Joan. And I do invoke his intercession in prayer. And like others who've done so, I have found that prayer was answered. And I cherish a holy card that was left on his tomb in St. Peter's and then given to me. I, I'm a very traditionally minded Catholic. I, I like relics and things in that way. And I ask him, John Paul, pray for me about this and this and this. and how can I put it? It works. He prays with me and with you and with others. I, I find it thrilling. And I met him a couple of times through my work with Aid to the Church in Need. And so I met a real saint. I mean, how thrilling. So he's my patron saint in a special way, I think. What, what was your favourite bit about his life? Um, you know, there were so many dramatic moments. Um, but uh, was it the travels or was it the writings or... Was it those you know, great acts of humility meeting the man who tried to kill him in St. Peter's Square or uh, the Marian, Marian devotion? What was, uh, I, think, I think for me, it was um, you know, just the kind of the, the masculinity that he exuded and being you know, sort of athletic and you know, uh, uh, outward going in, in you know, travels, in mountaineering in skiing um you know he just really showed what it was to be a man to be a leader um to be humble to be um intellectual uh, all those things together what what was the the out, most outlandish sort of feature of his personality or or life that, that you know there's so much but <laughs> just uh i think was, kind of... yes i think he was a, a glorious model of christian masculinity Mm -hmm. yeah. And in an, in an age where fatherhood was degraded and ungraded, yeah. he is a father figure. And he popularized the expression Holy Father. I, I remember noticing that people referred to him as the Holy Father, and not just as the Pope. I mean, non-Catholics. When I was a child, the word Holy Father was a slightly soppy expression used by pious old ladies. But with John Paul, lots of people, news paper people and so on would, would media commentators holy father he was a gutsy bloke uh he withstood uh attempts on his life he was a real sportsman if there was one thing i would single out it was his repeated use of the beautiful expression the scriptural expression do not be afraid mm. and he taught us uh, that means it's a decision not to be afraid it doesn't mean uh, you know feel all cozy all the time but do not be afraid in a way it's a decision like the decision to love is a decision i will make this effort to love and so on so do not be afraid and with the strength from from christ you are not afraid so there was this gutsy, uh, strong thing, and the experience that he had of surviving the loss of his mother when he was a little fellow, the loss of his father, just as his own teens ended, the loss of his country invaded by the Nazis, the loss of freedom under communism. But he was, he was able to say, do not be afraid. He also combined very considerable, very considerable academic skills, fine philosopher and, and theologian, 
superb linguist, uh, fluent in, I think it was seven languages, but always learning more, and including steeped in the great classical tradition and so on. Uh, so fluent, comfortable in Latin and so on, spoke, of course, uh, comfortably French, German and so on, that deep, resonant voice speaking English with a Slavonic accent. <laughs> um, but these were uh, at the serious academic, very much so, years of lecturing in philosophy at the University of Lublin, uh, uh, but with a sportsman, with an outgoing thing. Uh, and he taught us to be well rounded. You don't put everything in little compartments. And he spoke, understanding his role as successor of Peter. And when he referred to himself, it was rather good. I, John Paul, son of Poland, cry to you. Imagine how Poles would have felt. <laughs> um, and this idea, when he arrived in Britain, he said, for the first time in history, a bishop of Rome sets foot on English soil. This was seeing himself, I mean, this is great stuff. This is seeing himself yeah. in context. And um, to me, he opened up an understanding of what it is to have the successor of Peter, guarantor of truth, able to say the church hasn't always done things in the right way, but she is custodian of the truth. And there's a, there's a marital understanding, this nuptial imagery, God and his people, Christ and his church. And somehow he brought this alive of what Mother Church is and we're her children, very, very rich. I don't think we'd had that before. The church is not a sort of, you know, here are the rules. And she's not pomp and ceremony and ruling things. It's, this is truth. Mm. And I, Peter, am custodian of truth. I mean... Wow. And that's the message for the future. And the future is going to be astonishing. We're already talking about, you know, sending things to Mars. But in order to do that, you can't have a limited understanding of what the church is. It's not about a sort of worldly thing. It is about truth, truth, truth. And these days we talk about your truth and my truth, which is rubbish. There is the mm -hmm. truth. I think John Paul taught us this. And he was guardian of the truth is much bigger than him much bigger than him i really find that thrilling he was also a man of history he loved his country's traditions and culture in poland you know the church is local as well as huge and gigantic and going into space and time and eternity he was also homey and apparently at christmas he could sing polish carols for about an hour without once repeating himself you know fabulous stuff hmm. but the popes of the future will model themselves in so many ways on John Paul, on so many levels. Mm -hmm. um, so he is my hero, but don't get me wrong, I am a huge admirer of Pope Benedict. I think one day he'll be declared a doctor of the church. I, I don't really doubt that. I think he's the greatest thinker after Thomas Aquinas, who unpatched the great truths of the faith for the medieval mind and more. But Benedict mm -hmm. does it for the mind of modern man and woman. <laughs> asking mm -hmm. different questions. Just while we're about it, I have an affection for Pope Francis. Every Catholic must love the Holy Father. And I do when I pray for him. And this is, a, this is a guy who's trying his very best to communicate human warmth and truth in a difficult era. Let's pray for our beloved Holy Father. You bet. It's, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for the interview today. And uh, where can people find out more about your work? You've got uh, the Catholic History Walks website. I think that's uh, catholichistorywalks.com, I believe. Um, yes, it, you can reach me at the Catholic History Walks website. I don't have a me, me, Auntie Joanna, me website. I think it'd be totally gross, yeah. uh, boring. But find out about some of the things and come on a history walk. Or do And send me an email. You can reach me over the Catholic History Walks website and the email there. And uh, it's not only London. I do need history walks elsewhere and stuff. And well, like any author, I'd love you to buy my books. <laughs> No author that wouldn't like that. So have a go, you know, find out about my books. <laughs> yeah, it's been a real privilege speaking today. And thank you. Keep up the amazing work with uh, witnessing to the Catholic faith. Uh, we're going to have a lot more interviews here on, on Catholic Pulse. This is just the beginning of uh, the channel, but really grateful to you, Joanna, to get us started with the first interview. Um, so it's been lovely speaking, lovely speaking today and really interesting hearing about the many endeavours and projects and walks and books that you're involved with. Um, thank you for sharing with us today. It's been a lovely speaking with you and uh, wishing you blessings oh, yeah. as we come out, come out of lock, lockdown here in the UK. So 
thank you so much indeed, Joanna. I mean, God bless you. Uh, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Cheers.